Hi everyone, welcome to researchmd.com. We got another great presentation today. Our topic today is esophageal carcinoma, okay? And we're going to teach everything you need to know under nine minutes. Again, my name is Premier Charyat. I'm a program director, internal medicine residency, transitional residency. I teach medical students and residents on a regular basis. So let's get into our topic. So with the, um, we divided our presentation today, introduction, epidemiology, etiology, clinical future stage, in diagnosis, treatment, and the complications, okay? So start with the introduction, just a briefly about esophagus, 10 inch long hollow muscular tube. Connect the throat to the stomach, Con commonly known as like gastrointestinal tract, right? So when there are two types of esophageal cancer we need to know. One is common cell cancer and the other one is like adeno adeno carcinoma, okay? The squamous cell carcinoma is most commonly seen in the upper and middle part, and the adenocarcinoma is in the lower part, okay? Um, so you know, when you talk about squamous cell carcinoma, it starts in the esophageal cancer, starts in the squamous cells, uh, that line the esophagus. In adenocarcinoma, that begins the glandular tissue in the lower part of the esophagus. So we get like a brief structure of the esophageal wall. You have the mucosa, you got submucosa, muscularis layer, and adventitia, and then mucosa have several parts. Then you got the esophageal wall layers, you got the squamous epithelium up to the gastroesophageal junction, and then you got columnar gastric epithelium lining. Okay, let's look at the epidemiology. Adenocarcinoma is the most common type of esophageal cancer in the United States. Okay, squamous cell cancer, that's the most common type of esophageal cancer worldwide. So we need to remember that, okay. The incidence, um, I mean, China range from like 1.5 um, to 4.5 percent. The USA, the among white is like 0 0.4 per 100,000. And uh, so the peak incidence could be anywhere from 60 to 70 years of age, okay? So what are those risk factors? Let's look at squamous cell uh, carcinoma risk factors. You got alcohol consumption, smoking, diet low, fruits and vegetable drinking, um, alcohol, I mean, hot beverages, echolasia, nitrosamine ex explosion, premer wilson syndrome, necaustic strictures, diabetic, uh, radiation therapy, esophageal candidiasis, and betel nut chewing, okay? Localization, mostly in the upper and two thirds of the esophagus, we already talked about it. And then what are the risk factors? Adenocarcinoma, you got um, gastroesophageal reflux like bad esophagus, obesity, smoking, and achalasia contribute to it. Clinical features, we got to talk about like, uh, first, I mean, always remember it's a silent disease for a long time. So if it is, it can remain asymptomatic for a long time until the symptoms kind of start suddenly, uh, usually be the slow, I mean, uh, swallowing difficulties or retrosinal discomfort. And then late stages, you can have progressive dysphagia, dinophagia, weight loss, retrosternal chest or back pain, anemia. You can less common symptoms like hematomasis, melina, and hoarseness. So remember, esophageal cancer is a silent disease. Typically, it becomes symptomatic at advanced stage. That's really bad. Now, we can the following stages, like it's also just briefly, you know, stage zero, stage one, stage two, stage three, four. So we got like nice diagram kind of explaining like the spread, you know, in stage four, it's like uh, that is the, the last stage that is can, you can spread all the way to like iota, okay? Now, diagnosis, EGD, um, the best initial and in the confirmatory test, direct visualization of the tumor, you do the biopsy. You do barium solo, we can look at the asymmetrical and irregular borders of the esophagus with the characteristics of stenosis and proximal dilatation. Sensitive but does not allow a confirmation because you need a biopsy, right? And then staging, you got um, you can do transesophageal endoscopic ultrasound, chest CT and a bronchoscopy and laparoscopy depending upon the spread of the disease. Now how do you treat it? Curate it, right? Locally invasive disease that not invaded surrounding the structures. Um, and then you got high grade metaplasia and Barrett syndrome. There is, um, you know, you can do you can do like a neoadjunctive chemo radiation for downstaging, and then um, uh, you can do like a laser resection. Definite treatment patient with the proven complete response, like during endoscopy. And here, like surgical resection, you can do endoscopic submucosal resection, removal of the superficial epithelial lesion. You got the subtotal or total um, esophagectomy with the gastric pull through procedure or colonic interposition. And then we have palliative. Um, and then indicate a patient, for a palliative patient with advanced disease, pretty much palliative. You can put a stent, you can chemo radiation, those are the... Uh, uh, so you, in the initial, if it is like a locally invasive or high-grade metaplasia, then you can do the uh, surgical resection is option, neoadjuvant chemo radiation is option. Remember, if it's palliative advanced disease, then you have to talk about chemo radiation and the 
stent placement, which is you know, mainly the comfortable treatment. So six types of standard treatment are used, surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, chemo radiation therapy, laser therapy, and electric, electro, um, electrocoagulation. Now, surgery is the most common treatment of cancer of the esophagus. Part of the esophagus may be removed by operation called esophagectomy, and then esophageal stent, that's more like a palliative, a stent is placed in the esophagus to keep it open so we can swallow the food and lick it to pass through. And let's look at some of the drugs recently approved for esophageal cancer. You got Kale, you got Kale Ruda, that is like a pembrolizumab, okay? It is a highly selective humanized monoclonal IgG4 antibody. So a lot of monoclonal antibodies coming for the treatment of cancer with the less side effects and all that. The drug blocks the PD-1 receptor, preventing the binding and activation of the PD-L1 and PD-L2. The mechanism causes activation of T-cell-mediated immune response against the tumor cells. Then you got Obdivo, Nivolumab, and the drug combination is esophageal cancer. You got um, FELV, XCLRI, drug approved for gastroesophageal junction cancer. You got um, Syramsa um, and uh, Desataxel, Herceptin. You got Ketruda, Lonserf, and then uh, Pembrolizumab. Or ramuzilzumab, taxoline, and tastinumumab, and trifluoridine, and uh, typical hydrochloride. Okay, those are the treatment options available. Then you look at the treatment option with the esophageal, esophageal cancer become recurrent. The treatment options are like a little bit different. You can have like clinical trials kind of focusing on currently on photon therapy to photon radiation therapy for esophageal cancer. You can olaparibib and um, ramuzirimab in treating patients with metastatic or locally recurrent gastric or gastroesophageal junction cancer. And then dose escalation. And then you got nivolumab and uh, uh, epilitumab in treating patients with esophageal and the gastroesophageal junction adenocarcinoma undergoing surgery. Okay, the complication, what kind of complication? Again, esophageal stenosis, um, esoph tracheoesophageal fistula, passage of food and fluid into the respiratory tract, past operative, you got anastomotic leak or leak, leak or stricture, you got recurrent laryngeal nerve injury. All of this the combination. This are our reference for our presentation. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back with another presentation. Please subscribe to our channel.